please allow me to start by expressing my extraordinary gratitude for the privilege of standing in this historic pulpit in what is one of the most remarkable churches in the United States of America. And just to have one of the best possible views of that extraordinary stained glass on the West End. I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, th this is very special for me. I'm the Dean and President of Virginia Theological Seminary, as Sam explained. And uh, the connection with Phillips Brooks is one that we share. I mean, Phillips Brooks really was perhaps the greatest churchman the Episcopal Church has ever known. Quite, quite remarkable man. And I am deeply grateful, Sam, for the privilege of standing here. And let me also take this opportunity just to let you all know, and you know this already anyway, but Sam is Sam and Marguerite are, are special friends of my wife, Leslie, and me. And we think the world of them. They are just very, very special in our lives. And it's a privilege to be here and a privilege to be with you this weekend. Thank you. So, we have a German exchange student staying with us. Her name's Sophia. She's staying for the year. And uh, she is lovely. She's 16 years old. And I was doing Christmas shopping. And we were both together in the car. And um, we were driving around. We were trying to pick out something for my wife, Leslie. And I thought the expertise of a 16-year-old German exchange student is exactly what I needed. And as we were driving along, she suddenly turned to me and she said, so how many days are there in a typical life? What a great question. I mean, what a fabulous question. It's not a question you ask very often. So I said, you know, this is a great thing about technology. She got the phone out. She timed 365. We went for 80 as a typical life, a bit high, but nevertheless, let's be hopeful. So we went for 80, and then the answer is 365 multiplied by 80 years is 29,200 days. Now, I don't know about you, but I was a bit surprised because if you convert that number into dollars, then that buys you a Subaru Outback which is what we were actually driving along in. And then she followed it up with a question, so how many of those days have you used? So I said, go for it, you know. Let's get the info. 53 times 365, the answer is 19,345. I've only got 10,000 days to go. This is all a bit worrying. So I said, OK, it's your turn. What about you? How many days have you used of your Subaru Outback? So she did the numbers, 16 times 365. The answer was 5,840. There you go. 5,840 days she had used. Do you know what's interesting is we then started talking about the fact that what we ought to do is not only have our annual birthdays, but you ought to really have a big celebration when you hit those thousand days. Don't you think that'd be cool? You know, you could try and work out when your next thousandth day birthday is and have a huge party. And the cool thing about this is a thousand days is what? That's three years and two months. So uh, you would actually have them rotating through the year. So you would have a different celebration. You would hit different seasons, which would be quite nice. So we were having this great conversation, and then suddenly she went quiet. I said, so what's the matter, Sophia? She said, actually, I haven't been around for 5,840 days. And I said, yes, you have. You're 16. She said, no. The first 1,000 days, you can't count. I can't remember anything that happened. <laughs> Do you know, I shared this little exercise we did together in the car because it reminds us afresh of the precious nature of time. It is the greatest gift that God gives us. The old axiom, make every day count, is a good one. And I think most of us do, most of the time, strive to use every day as constructively as possible even if you do end up binge-watching Downton Abbey for three-quarters of it. 
And most of us, if we think about ourselves, find ourselves thinking, yes, I want to be able to look back over our 29,200 days and see some sort of trajectory of achievement. We want to have mattered in some way. I suppose we all, deep down, want to be significant. We want to matter to someone or do something. We want to be known by our children as great parents, or at least good ones, or at least not damaging ones. We want to be known at work as good employees. We want to be known amongst our friends and in our neighborhood as exciting dinner table conversationalists. From the moment we graduate from high school to the moment we retire, we worry constantly about our place in the world and how well we're doing. Now, history grants rulers a special place for significance. That's the reason why, brothers and sisters, so many people are interested in being the president of the United States. You might have heard we're in the middle of an election season, in case you haven't noticed. Just getting elected is sufficient to guarantee name recognition, a lucrative book deal on your memoirs, and of course, an opportunity to do some stuff. So today's gospel is really interesting. It's a running theme for Luke. He constantly places Jesus. So throughout this gospel, we know about the politics of his day. Here we have Herod, the Roman appointed king of Judea, famous for numerous building projects and infamous, of course, because he was the one who killed John the Baptist. So when Jesus is warned that Herod is out to get Jesus, Jesus knew this guy had a track record. Herod doesn't want Jesus around. And then you have that great reply, fabulous reply. Jesus uses humorous imagery that puts Herod in his place. Go and tell that fox for me. I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I finish my work. Go and tell that fox for me. I love it. It's great. The point of this is clear. Herod, says Jesus, don't overstate your significance. The ruler might feel that he is where it is at. The ruler might feel that he has the authority to bring about what matters. The ruler might feel that he is what matters. But oh no, says Jesus, the truth is significance is where God is. Significance is in the hard work of bringing wholeness, both in mind and spirit, to those in need. The ruler might imagine that he, in this case, is in control, but really, says Jesus, God is in control. It was the preacher from Nazareth. It was the guy who didn't go to university. It was the guy who didn't have a lot of stuff. It was that person who really was significant. Brothers and sisters, the invitation of worship is to revisit our priorities. That's what we do when we worship God. We're giving God ultimate worth, God who love and justice and mercy, and in giving ultimate worth to God, we then are invited to reflect on our values. Are we living lives with those values preeminent in our lives? Today's gospel is an invitation. Instead of constantly worrying about our status, 
instead of constantly striving for visibility in the crowd. The invitation of this gospel is to make sure we're letting God help us to make our days significant. Listen afresh in this liturgy, this Lent, to the utterance of God, the voice of God reminding us of what really matters. God wants us to be a little less preoccupied with ourselves and more preoccupied with others. God wants us to be a little less preoccupied with visibility and credit and a little more preoccupied with doing the right thing just because it's right. God wants us to be a little less anxious and a little more trusting that the timetable of our future is in God's hands. So brothers and sisters, let us take each day of our precious 29,200, less the initial thousand, which we can't really remember. Let's take each day and ensure the focus is others, the focus is God, the focus is the eternal. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.